Kurt Miller. I'm the youth director here at Gainesville Church, and it's just so wonderful to be worshiping with all of you here this morning. We'd also like to extend a welcome to all those folks that are watching at home through our live stream. Thank you so much for being a part of worship today. But for all of you who are here in person, would you please stand if you are able for our opening hymn this morning, People Look East. may be seated. And we'd like to invite the Raja family up to the front for our first Advent reading of the year. Praise the Lord. It is, it is remarkable how easy it can be to forget about Jesus during the Christmas season. We become distracted by all sort of things, events to attend, traditions to keep up, gifts to buy, and all sort of other things. Before we know it, we celebrated a whole season of celebrating Jesus without actually ever celebrating Jesus. The early church began the practice of lighting candles as a way to symbolize God's illuminating places and things in their lives, as well as a way of showing God's presence and light in all times and situations. This morning, we reclaim that practice as we light the first candle of the Advent wreath. This candle represents hope, hope for each and every single one of us, but also hope for our church and hope for churches and Christians across this country. Hope that this year our Christmas wouldn't just be filled with distractions, presents, traditions and parties, but that our Christmas would primarily be filled with worship, praise, celebration and time with Jesus. Hope that today we would begin the journey of truly using this time of year to draw near to Jesus through our words, actions, and choices. Please bow your head and pray with me. Dear Lord, this morning we ask for your guidance, wisdom, and power. Give us the strength and courage to focus on you. Reveal yourself to us in ways we simply can't ignore. And let this be the first most power Christmas we have ever experienced with you. Jesus, Amen. So we have a few connection opportunities, things that are coming up within the life of the church that we want to make sure that you are all uh, aware of. And the first is going to be coming up on Saturday, December 9th, and that is our Cookies with Santa event. We're going to have a morning here at the church from 10 till noon where we've got uh, pictures with Santa, we've got cookies, we've got crafts and games and other activities for the young kids. If you know any young kids in your life that would uh, enjoy a morning like that, we would very much invite them and you to come to this event. 
event. Uh, but if you would like to help out with that event as a youth or as an adult, uh, sign-ups to help out are on the church website. You can help out with setup, with breakdown, uh, with making the, the cookies that we are, are uh, handing out there, as well as helping with the crafts that morning. It's going to be a very fun time, uh, and we would love for you to be there. If you haven't already seen it, um, we have our angel tree up, which we do every year. This year, uh, we are hoping to support over 150 people with our angel tree. Most of those are children in the public schools who are living in poverty and will not receive gifts this Christmas season. Uh, but there's also tags on there for um, the elderly and senior citizens in our community who don't have family near them and bringing them gifts at Christmas, as well as 25 families uh, who attend Gainesville Middle School um, who are in need of clothes and necessary items that we are supporting. Uh, this is my annual lecture on this. Many of us uh, will, if we already haven't started, spend a whole lot of money on people and friends in our lives that we love who don't actually need any of the things we are getting for them. And so uh, we all have the capacity uh, to take one of those tags and provide something in the same way we would for our family and loved ones for a person who is in need. We know not everybody is in this position, but you know, Alicia and I make it a family practice every year. Uh, we go find the most expensive tag that we can on that tree, uh, and that's the one we take to provide for somebody in need because it's our way of um, showing somebody out there who otherwise wouldn't receive anything that there are people who might not know them but still deeply love them and so please 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 go take a look at our angel tree as you leave this morning items are due back unwrapped with the tag attached to them on december 7th and you may not have noticed but the sanctuary is decorated a little differently today. Don't worry, we're going to be talking about that. Um, our theme for the Advent season this year is the uncomplicated Christmas. What we're going to be doing is taking a look at some of the things that uh, may feel like Christmas and things that we might call Christmas, but ultimately they can be distractions from the true meaning of Christmas that we're going to be talking about. So you'll see the stage and uh, general decorations here at the church change as we go from week to week to week as we approach uh, Christmas. Uh, and speaking of Christmas Eve, um, we have uh, these handy postcards and little business cards that have all the information about our Christmas Eve services. We're going to be doing quite a few that day, including uh, a worship service that morning because it's a Sunday at 10 a.m., followed by brunch with uh, candlelight traditional and modern services throughout the evening, as well as for the first time we're doing an 11 o'clock service. So if you'd like to be here up till midnight for Christmas Eve, we are doing that this year. Um, grab one of these on the way out. You can put it on your fridge, keep it as a reminder for when our services are going to be on Christmas Eve, but you can also give these to a friend, invite them. Um, if they don't have any plans for Christmas Eve for a, a church home, we would love for you to invite them here to Gainesville. Well, before we hear the message this morning, will you all please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this time that we can gather here together and worship you. We pray, Lord, that uh, as Pastor Benson give the, gives the message this morning, that his words be your words, and to help us better unpack and understand the meaning of Christmas. Uh, in your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Bert. Our scripture this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Luke, uh, the 10th chapter, the very end of the chapter. This is uh, verses 38 through 42. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. This is the word of God for us, the people of God, and we all say together, thanks be to God. I feel like... Um, more than ever this morning, my message uh, 
is not just directed at our church, but it, it also uh, is directed at myself. And that's because uh, I have found myself in a season of exhaustion. Uh, I, I am just tired, uh, and I am exhausted. I uh, meant to take some time away to recharge, uh, which uh, I didn't totally get, and that just kept me exhausted. Uh, and then after the supposed to be time away, uh, I got in the car with my family. We drove to Virginia Beach. Uh, we had a great time with our family down there celebrating Thanksgiving, but uh, it's not necessarily rest. Uh, so I came back last night, still exhausted. Uh, and now I look at uh, what is generally considered to be the busiest time uh, in the church calendar, and I find myself wondering when I'm not going to be exhausted. And on top of that, uh, Alicia and I, uh, we scheduled the C-section for the birth of our daughter on December 22nd. Uh, so that feels like I'm not getting any rest after that moment either. Uh, and I'm pretty sure I'm just going to be exhausted for the rest of my life. That's my plan, at least so far. And so in the midst of all of that, I've been... Um, I've just been really praying to God and uh, thinking about what our church needs during the Advent or Christmas season and asking God to share uh, with me what our church needs during the Advent and Christmas season this year. And I find myself... Um, really just being called to focus on the here and the now. Because I think the way that we do church generally at this time is, is we actually try to ramp it up to Christmas Eve. But as I've been thinking about that, um, I've realized that no matter what we do as a church for the next month, no matter what we do, the same thing is going to happen on Christmas Eve. And that's that. Lots of people are going to show up, right? We'll all show up. People who aren't here today will show up. People who have never shown up before will show up, right? People we haven't seen in years will show up. It, it doesn't matter what you do during Advent. Everyone's still going to fill the church on Christmas Eve. They might not fill our 11 o'clock p.m. service, but I'll be there for that. Uh, it's going to happen. And so I just found myself saying, why try to ramp something up to what we already know is going to be, uh, when instead we, we could take a month as a church and actually say, what does it look like to focus, genuinely focus, on Jesus during the Christmas season? If, if your Christmas is anything like mine, uh, it becomes insanely complicated really quick. As we were having dinner last night, Alicia and I, we, we keep a family calendar in our kitchen. We started filling out the calendar, and I was so excited, because at first we had like one or two things on the calendar that we had to do in the month of December. By the end of dinner... We had remembered so many things that we forgot to put on the calendar that we now have something scheduled for every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday in December. I'm already looking at our family calendar feeling exhausted, like consumed by Christmas. And on top of that, I have all the other things that have to be done during Christmas. I have to decorate the house. I have to decorate the yard, which is where these inflatables are going after the service today. Uh, I have to buy gifts for people. I have to make sure I get the gifts in time to ship those gifts to people. Then on top of that, we, we have a two-year-old right now, Maverick, and uh, he's great, but people in our lives uh, feel a need to buy him presents. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, you just bought my kid a gift. I was not planning on buying your kid a gift, but now I have to buy your kid a gift to be socially polite. And so that adds up. My schedule's consumed. My finances are consumed. 
uh, my thoughts and my actions are, are just consumed by Christmas. And so as I've been thinking about that, praying through that, I find myself going to the Christmas story and realizing, this is not a new realization, mind you, that my Christmas looks dramatically different than God's Christmas. My Christmas is a financial scheduling priority juggling act. God's Christmas takes less than half a chapter in Scripture to explain. It goes something like this. This is, this is how incredibly simple Christmas actually is. An angel comes to Mary. She says, you're going to give birth to the Messiah. His name is Jesus. Then the angel shows up to Joseph, who is engaged to Mary, and says, Mary's going to give birth to the Messiah. His name is Jesus. Then Mary, spoiler alert, gives birth to the Messiah. His name is Jesus. And some shepherds praise him. That's it. That's Christmas. Like, quite simple, incredibly uncomplicated. And so, as a church, for, for the next month, we are going to do, like, a reverse Advent or a reverse Christmas. I asked our staff and, and people that help out with the decorations, I said, I want the first Sunday of Advent for it to look like Christmas threw up all over our sanctuary. That's what I want. That's why I'm wearing this sweater today, too. And then, throughout Advent or Christmas, the Christmas season, we're going to actually pull decorations away. So my genuine hope is at the very end of this holiday, the only thing we possibly have left to focus on is Jesus himself. So as I was praying about this, this passage out of Luke 10 kept coming to my mind, which is absolutely in no way, shape, or form an Advent story or a Christmas story. But as I kept reading, I kept saying, like, that's my story. Th this is what my Christmas looks like. It looks like this woman named Martha who wants to invite Jesus into her home. And so she does it. And then she spends the rest of the story not able to pay attention to Jesus at all. To the point that she even starts complaining to Jesus about her sister who's paying attention to Jesus, telling Jesus to tell her sister to stop paying attention to Jesus. Is that not what happens to all of us every Christmas? I want to focus on Jesus until all the stuff comes up that takes us away from Jesus, and then we end up telling everybody else to help us with all the stuff opposed to paying attention to Jesus. I said, why is that? Because what takes us away from Jesus at Christmas, what, what makes our Christmas so complicated in a way it doesn't need to be, is that we all become distracted. We all become distracted. And the thing about distractions, and the thing about each and every single one of us, myself included, when we get Christmas so wrong, is that the initial desire is correct. The initial desire in our lives is correct. This, this is how the story starts. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. So in other words, Martha, first of all, knew that Jesus was coming to her town. Second, she wanted Jesus to visit her house. And third, she invited Jesus into her house before anybody else could. That is a great initial desire. A desire to know God, to prepare for God, and to invite God in. There is nothing wrong with that. So many times our initial desires are spot on. Our initial desires are right where they need to be. It's, it's not that our hearts are wrong. It's not that we're bad people. It's, distractions never start as major problems. 
In fact, if, if you go along with this story, distractions, in fact, aren't even apparent until what really matters is right in front of us. Let me say that again, because I think that's true for, for all of us. Distractions aren't actually apparent until what matters is right in front of us. Alicia's family has this tradition that I go along with. Half the time I love it, half the time I hate it. But every year, uh, as a family, we go and visit uh, in Williamsburg, Bush Gardens Christmas Town, where the entire amusement park is covered in X number of billion Christmas lights. So uh, we take Maverick with us, obviously. I want him to have a great time. We have this family tradition. We're going to keep up this family tradition. We're going to all have fun as a family. The problem when you take a two-year-old to an amusement park is the two-year-old doesn't want to do what you want them to do. And so we spend all this money. We buy tickets. We travel there. Food costs an insane amount. Does Maverick want to ride any of the rides? No. Does he want to go to any of the shows? No. Does he want to look at any of the Christmas lights? No. He finds like the two places in the park that aren't decorated for Christmas and are, quite frankly, relatively boring playgrounds, in my humble opinion, and he just wants to run in circles. Does he want hot chocolate? No. Does he want anything I think he should do to have a fun time? No. I'm sitting here getting upset and frustrated. I'm like, we're about to have forced family fun. <laughs> Maverick, do you want to ride a ride? No. What do you want to do? I want to run. Do you want to go do this? No. I want to run. I found myself getting so upset, and luckily, before I lost my cool, I had this moment of epiphany at the end of the day, all that matters is him having fun. Is that not why we wanted to go? And if that's what fun is for him, who am I to force him to do things for him to have a bad time because I think that's what he should be doing? The initial desire is good, and the distraction is not apparent until what's immediately, until what matters is immediately in front of us. Right? Martha doesn't get distracted until Jesus is actually in her home. It says this in verse 40, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. How many of us have invited people into our homes? Friends, family, whoever it might be. Or how many of us have been invited to somebody else's home? And yet the moment you get there, or the moment company arrives at your house, you start doing everything else but spending time with the people you invited over. This is what happens to so many of us at Christmas time. We want it to be a season in which we re-welcome God into our lives. We want it to be a season in which we celebrate the birth of Christ. And yet the moment that opportunity presents itself, we become consumed by everything except for that opportunity. The other thing about distractions is they're never as big as we think they are. They are never as big as we think they are. Now, this example has gone over like a lead balloon in two services, but 
does not keep me from trying it a third time. I don't know if any of you have this problem in your life, but I, I feel like I have a special gift for getting things caught in my teeth and not being aware of it. Great, good, good. This is the best response I've gotten to that so far. I feel like it's not unique to me. What comes along with that special gift of a piece of cilantro or oregano stuck on my canine is that I usually don't realize it until I've already like spoken to a hundred people. And then I get home or go to the bathroom, wherever I happen to look in the mirror, and I realize I've just had this chunk of food stuck to my tooth for who knows how long. All of a sudden, thoughts just start filling my brain. Did people even hear what I said? Were they just staring at that piece of food the whole time, right? Oh my gosh, who did I embarrass myself in front of? Was I having some deep, meaningful conversation with somebody and all they thought of is like, is that pepper? Is that oregano? What's sticking up right there, right? Why did no one tell me that I've looked like a fool all day with this food stuck to my teeth? The distraction becomes this huge ordeal in our minds. When in fact, most people are probably just like, oh, that's kind of embarrassing, but that happens to all of us, and they move on. Distractions are always bigger to us than they actually are to anybody else. Th this is Martha. She's consumed by these preparations that she feels like she has to make. And yet the person whose opinion on him actually matters, Jesus, tells her, why are you doing that? Not only does he tell her, why are you doing that? He, in fact, tells her to stop doing it. He says, you have picked many things, but few things are needed. In fact, only one thing is needed, and that one thing is me. In other words, everything she's picked that she feels like is this big deal is it actually a big deal? If your family does not continue some Christmas tradition, I promise you, your family will not fall apart. If you choose not to attend some Christmas event, I promise you, you will still have friends. The things that we choose to do at Christmas time that we feel like are so important. Jesus is looking at us just, just like he's telling Martha. It's like, they really aren't. You've just convinced yourself that they matter. If you don't get your loved one or your kid or somebody in your life the most perfect present in the world, I promise you, they will be okay. Okay. I'm so exhausted, I totally forgot my mom's birthday last week. She still loves me. <laughs> it's working out. It's just, life will go on. We will be okay. Because the worst thing about distractions is actually what they produce in our life. This is what Jesus says to Martha in verse 41. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things. What does the distraction in Martha's life generate? We're told that it generates two things. Her to be worried and her to be upset. And yet Jesus... And the Gospels offers us a variety of things. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus offers his disciples joy. He offers his disciples peace. And he offers each and every single person love. And so at some point, we, we have to look at ourselves and have a sort of heart-to-heart -heart conversation and say, why is it in my life that my Christmas season creates anxiety and worry 
It makes me upset when the one whom I'm supposed to be celebrating at Christmas is offering me peace and hope and rest and joy and love. I chuckled this morning when I got to church and I saw the sign uh, just past the offices. If you don't go that way, it says, Today is Family Worship Sunday. I thought, what a perfectly fitting Family Worship Sunday. Because I saw all the parents' faces as they came in at our 8 o'clock, 9.30, even this service. It was not a face of peace and joy and rest. It was a face of worry. Maybe upset. I didn't see too many of those, right? But it's like, oh my gosh, my kids are going to be in worship. I've said it every service so far. I'll say it again. I've never been in the middle of a sermon and had to stop the sermon to tell some kid to be quiet. I'll just preach right through it. And you know what? It's fine. I've never been in a worship service where we've just halted worship because some kid was too loud. Parents always feel like their children are these huge distractions. That distraction doesn't create to joy or love or peace that their kids are getting to experience a worship service with the larger church community. It leads to worry and fear or embarrassment even though no one else feels that way. In fact, we have people in our church that change services they go to every once in a while just to be around a whole bunch of noisy kids because they like that sound of young life in the church. And yet parents are like looking for the ejector seat in their pew when their kid makes the tiniest little peep. It's like we're all going to be fine. The 8 o'clock service this morning, it, was, it could not have worked out better. I gave them a moment of silence for prayer, and this baby at the 8 o'clock service, the moment I gave people silence, just started going, <laughs> was I upset? I smiled. It was amazing. We just love that that noise is being made in our church. It's not a distraction, but because we think it's a distraction, it begins to produce all of these things in our lives, even in our church, that aren't what Jesus is about. So my hope, my, my prayer for our church, I mean, beyond just our church, but for our country and for churches across our country and across the world in general, is what if we actually had a Christmas season, an Advent, where we allowed ourselves to stop being distracted and truly focused and stripped Christmas down until all there was left to focus on was Jesus himself? Would we not then have the potential to have the most powerful and spiritually nourishing and awakening Christmas we've had in a long, long time. And so for the next four weeks, uh, that is my goal, that is my hope for our church. That each week we will pull another thing away from Christmas in order to make Jesus all the more evident. And we're going to look at, because it's really hard, to remove the distractions in our lives. So we're going to look at what are the four big things that are causing us distractions from Christmas, how we correct those in order to experience this amazing opportunity that we have every year, a month dedicated to just focusing in and celebrating the birth of Jesus. So we're going to look at how, how do we get time and our schedules under control? How do we reset our priorities in a life-giving way? How do we experience and make an impact in generosity that actually moves us closer to God? 
And then ultimately, how do we focus on things that last beyond things uh, that are only meaningful for a short time? And so I hope you will find this month to be a month of spiritual renewal and spiritual awakening. But I also hope that you will invite somebody into this process with us because we live in a world in which people are so distracted that we've lost complete sight of God. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Almighty God, we love you and we praise you. This morning, Lord, I give you thanks for an opportunity, a month to be drawn close to you. And so I pray for each and every single person who's a part of our church that over the next month they would be drawn closer to you. The distractions in their lives would be removed so that they can move closer to you, Lord. And that there would be a spiritual renewal, a, a spiritual revival and awakening in this place, in this community, in churches across this country as we celebrate your goodness, Lord, and discover all the things that you want to produce and build in our lives. We love you and we praise you, and we pray it all in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, choir. As we come to uh, a time of prayer, I, um, I want us to pray for two things specifically this morning. First is, I want to give you a, a time of silence. To just spend time talking with God, thinking about God. About what are the distractions in your life? This is your opportunity. What are the distractions in your life that you can let go of to, to focus and experience all the goodness that Jesus is offering you? And the second thing is, uh, I, I was thinking about the irony of all the times we sing in different Christmas carols about peace on earth. Uh, and it's like at Christmas time, we all just assume there's world peace. And especially in a, a year like this, that's just not the case. And so, really, we have hope for world peace. And, and that hope should lead us towards prayer. And so, I'd also like us to pray about that this morning. But if you would, let's bow our heads and go to the Lord in prayer together. Almighty God, we come before you. I thank you, Lord. I thank you for the things you offer us in the midst of this world. I thank you that you offer us hope, that you offer us love and joy and peace. Lord, I pray that your spirit would give us the wisdom and the eyes to know and see the distractions in our lives that even with the best of intentions might be keeping us from you. And so, Father, we take this time now, this time of silence, to come to you, to dwell on that, to reflect on that, Lord, give us the strength. To let go of all the things we think need to be done. In order to do the one thing that does need to be done. Which is to sit at your feet and worship you. And Lord, in a time in which we sing about peace and hope. We pray for our world. Lord, you are the Prince of Peace. This is a celebration of your arrival. And so, Lord, we know that it is only through you, Jesus, that there can and will be peace. And so we pray for that. We hope for that. We pray for that peace in parts of this world that are torn apart by war and violence. We pray for that in places where hatred and atrocities and evils reign supreme. We pray for that in our own neighborhoods and communities where people might be consumed by ways of worldly living. Where peace isn't found because it's been pushed so far down on the priority list.
Lord, we just ask you to move. We ask your spirit to move. Because in the end, Lord, you are the only thing that matters. And so, Lord, we pray these things this morning with a level of boldness and a level of confidence that only comes from you, Lord, who hears and answers all prayers. And in your infinite love for us, you taught us how to pray, Jesus. And so we join our hearts and our voices together as we pray the prayer that you taught us, Lord. And for those who need it as it appears on the screens behind me, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We conclude our time of worship this morning through the singing of our final hymn, Fairest Lord Jesus. And I just want to point out as we prepare to stand and sing, we will sing more Christmas carols, I promise. But I really wanted our music this morning to be directed and focused on the thing that matters most, which is Jesus himself. Let us stand and sing together. As always, if you came prepared to worship God through your giving this morning, we want to let you know you can do so through the offering plates at the back of the sanctuary or through our giving kiosk or for those who give online. A huge thank you to all of you and your generosity that make everything we do here possible. If you're worshiping with us this morning, as always, we don't want you to feel any pressure to give. Rather, we hope this service has been a gift to you. Do not be distracted. It leads to worry, upsetness, anxiety. Rather, let us focus on Jesus, who offers us peace and rest, joy and hope, and life in him. Go in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>